Well, that was kind of cool. <laughs> At least for me it was, so hope it was for you too. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike, and i um, glad to be with you if you're here for the first time or if you are online for the first time or whatever. We're glad you're here with us. We're in the second week um, of a series. Uh, last week, we kicked it off. Dave kicked it off. We're talking about sharing our faith, which was so cool to hear JJ. And what, what JJ shared wasn't his conversion story. It's a current story of how God is working in his life today, which is cool. And we all have stories like this, you know, in, in different eras of our life. And so, but last week, Dave, if you were here, you heard Dave kick off our um, series, and we all created our Franck list. Do you remember that? You guys remember what that, what's F? Friends, R? Relatives, A? Yep. N? Neighbor, and C? Coworkers. And then you put it on your fridge, right? That's what he said to do, you people. I don't know. How do you expect God to work when you don't listen to the pastor? <laughs> anyway, um, and it was kind of an interactive thing, sort of like filling in some blanks and some cues. We're going to continue today to be interactive. Now, you may have noticed we don't have any instruments up here. That's because there's not going to be music today. Okay? I was hoping for more sadness, but uh, <laughs> that's just my own issue. I'll work it out. Uh, anyway, uh, we're not going to be, because we're going to do something really kind of fun and interactive. In just a few minutes when I'm done, I'm going to have, uh, Jason Dunn's going to come up here and guide you through, in a similar fashion, uh, how to actually craft a story. And we're going to be talking about stories today and uh, how, how to craft your story in such a way. And story is cool because it's one of the foundational pillars of communication. I don't know if you think about this, but it, it literally is one of the foundational pillars of communication. When you're very, very little, you love to climb up on your mom's lap or your grandpa's lap and have them read stories to you. Right? And then I'm, one of my fondest memories of elementary school was story time, where the teacher would sit, and we'd sit on the carpet, and they'd read stories. But it doesn't stop when you're just a child. When Susie and I go on vacation, we always stream or we check out audiobooks, and we listen to the books as we're traveling to pass the time. And our daily life kind of reflects the value of story. When Susie gets home, let me tell you what doesn't happen. Okay? This does not happen. I say, hi. Well, this part does. Hi, Susie. Tell me about your day. That part happens. What doesn't happen is this. Well, Mike, I got in my car and I drove to my workplace, which is an elementary school building. I went to my assigned workspace, which is a classroom. It was decorated appropriately for their age to enhance the learning environment. I interacted with all the students. They showed varying degrees of mastery across the curriculum. I talked to the principal twice, uh, 14 different parents got back in the car and came home, how was your day? That's not what happens. What happens is she tells me the stories about all those individual interactions, and what happens is I understand not only what happened in her day, but how it affected her, right? Because story is more than just exchanging information. And then if you're all like me after dinner, we often will go to a movie or we'll turn on Netflix or Hulu or whatever, and we... Watch stories unfold. And what, what's interesting is as you're watching these stories, you're not, again, just getting information. You're emotionally responding. How many of you guys saw Making a Murderer when it was, like, big? Okay, six of you will get this then. So <laughs> ready to pick the, pick the winner example. Anyway, it's a documentary about, it's a documentary about this guy who goes to jail. Anyway, you don't really need to know the story, but... As we're watching this, and this is a long documentary, as we're watching this, it's like one o'clock in the morning. I can't stop watching it because I'm so incited. I'm literally, and Susie is too, we're yelling at the TV, you can't do that. It's illegal because it's more than an information exchange. It's an emotional exchange. And there's a new one out, Sins of My Mother. I recommend it. Then, though, maybe you've experienced the musical story versions right, of like Hamilton, which is about our font, one of our founding fathers, or Les Mis, about French Revolution, right, uh, Phantom of the Opera, about a guy with a half a hockey mask, <laughs> right? Uh, you get in your car, what do you do? Turn the radio on, or you stream Spotify or iTunes, and what are, what are songs? Stories. 
this summer, we went and one of my favorite country artists is Jason Aldean, and Gabby Barrett was with him. And she has a song you probably know. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what the, what, the, what the title is. I'll get to that in the chorus. But the song kind of goes like this. I hope when he smiles, it makes you smile. And I, and I, and I hope that you're so happy. And I, and I, and I hope that um, when you hear that song on the radio, it makes you think of him. And, and then I hope he puts a ring on your finger. And, and I, hope, I hope life is good. Chorus? And then I hope he cheats like you did on me. Okay? <laughs> Very clear story. And the people who've been cheated on sing that song like an anthem because they have an emotional engagement with the story. And I guess since we're at church, maybe we should talk about the Bible. The Bible is a story from beginning to end connected by a collection of stories. Creation of the earth, the flood, uh, Joseph and his technicolor dream coat, got Adam and the miracle baby at 100 years old, David kills Goliath, Jonah and the big fish, and then you go to the New Testament, and we actually see that story was Jesus' primary way of teaching. 42 parables recorded throughout the Gospels. And a parable, if you don't know, is just a story that illustrates a principle. And that was Jesus' primary way of teaching. Now, as I said, story is one of the foundational pillars of communication, but it's also like the fabric of community because it shares information, it connects our emotions and our experiences and our intellect with one another as we share them. It breaks down walls when we're vulnerable and share our weaknesses and our fears and our brokenness. And we find ourselves in little bits and pieces in each other's story. When you hear someone's story, you connect to it. And we realize that we're not alone and that other people are dealing with the stuff that I thought I was the only person dealing with. And we realize, hey, wait a second, you're not perfect either. And in that moment, we feel safe and we can communicate and connect. But here's what's a bit confusing about story is while we all understand the importance of story Many of us have never taken the time to sit down and organize and craft our story in a compelling way so that someone else can hear it and interact at the best level possible. I'm not talking about making stuff up. What we typically do is we craft a story on the fly where it makes us look good. <laughs> we wear our false stories around. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Telling your true story, and the story I'm talking about in specific is how Jesus Christ has interacted with your life, and like JJ, how it's made a difference in my day-to-day -day living. And so we're going to be looking at that today, and here's what's even a little bit trickier, that for many of us, we feel as though our story is not really all that important. I've heard your story, mine's not that important. Or we're intimidated to share it because we are afraid of what someone will think about our story. And here's what I want you to understand. If there is a reason you're excusing yourself for not sharing your story because you think it's unimportant or other people won't care, hear this one thing. You are wrong. Your story is important, and it's important for other people. So today, what I want to do is I want to spend the next few minutes Together, looking at what makes a story compelling or uh, captivating or persuasive. And then we're going to have some fun with this for just a second, so I'll get there. And then we're going to talk about being ready to share your story at all times. And then Jason's going to come up, and he's going to guide us through this process of cultivating our story in the best way to tell it. But first, let me just be fair. Let me share a quick version of my story. And if you've, known, if you've been here for a while, if you know me, you've probably heard this story before. Just, just listen like it's new. And uh, I'm going to share my story, though. Here's, here's my story. And I'm just going to give you a short version of it. I was born into a Christian home because my dad would always say we were born on Saturday and in church on Sunday. I later learned I was actually born on a Sunday, so my childhood was a lie. Um, <laughs> But the reality is, we had church 
Sunday morning was a Sunday school class, then we had Sunday church, then we had Sunday night church, and then we had Wednesday night church. And we went to all of them. And I actually had a pretty good uh, feel, I mean, it was a pretty good experience overall. When I was five years old, my oldest brother led me in the sinner's prayer. That's where I confessed that I was a sinner and I needed Jesus to save me. I have no recollection of that, but I don't think he's lying. So Um, he led me through that prayer and I continued in living in a home where my Christianity was very cultural, but I didn't really understand it for myself. Fast forward till I'm in ninth grade and a really, really significant experience happened for me. Chuck Holmbaum was my Sunday school teacher in ninth grade, and it was the week before Easter, and he, he began talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he went into great detail talking about how Jesus was beaten and whipped and how he had to wear the, the thorns, and they spit on him, and they mocked him. And as he's sharing this story in front of the ninth grade class, he begins to weep. And we're all sitting there, and I'm like, oh, boy, this is kind of bad. But what hit me in that moment, like a light bulb going off, was like, wait, wait, hold on one second. Why is it that Chuck and I claim to believe the same thing, but I don't really care about Jesus' death like he does? And this became a recurring theme in my life. And the recurring theme was this. I lived sort of a FOMO approach. If you're over 45, that means fear of missing out. I had a FOMO script going on in my head. And so the FOMO came because I was not fully committed to one way of living. I was a good kid. I I wasn't like crazy or doing all kinds of nutty stuff. But I kind of lived with one foot doing whatever I wanted and one foot kind of in church world. And I realized something, and it was this. I had an ongoing FOMO, and I was always missing out because I wouldn't commit fully to something. And in that moment, when I realized that Chuck had a different faith than me, I said, that's what I want. And I committed my life to seeking him, and I found a true guidepost. And the most interesting thing is I no longer had as big an issue with FOMO because I didn't care about what I wasn't doing. I was living into something, and I had a guidepost. That was God's word, the Holy Spirit, and prayer. And my life became different. Now, I still struggle with stuff. I still have bills to pay. My things break. There are days when I am not my best version of a dad. There are also days when my kids are not the best version of the kids either, but (laughs) it's mostly me, I'm sure. Anyway, I'm not perfect. I don't live it out perfectly, but at least I'm living in a direction towards something, not away from something, not afraid of what I'm missing. You may hear that story and you say, well, that's nothing like mine. Or you might say, I hear pieces of it or it's just like mine. Whatever, however you hear this story, here's what I hope. I hope you can hear that I'm human like you. And I hope you hear that I'm a safe place to share your story. Because when we're vulnerable, we create safe places where we can all be honest with each other, which is why it's the fabric of community. So telling our story is the process of sharing the journey we're on and inviting others in to interact with it. So I want to take just a few minutes here. I'm going to push a big giant pause button That's my story. I hope you're convinced in the value of story. But I want to help you understand something. There's this thing, it's called the hero's journey. How many of you know what the hero's journey is? All right, a handful of you. The hero's journey is a template that's used to tell stories when they're making films. It's it's an actual template. There's 12 12 parts of this this process. And what I want to do is I want to look at this hero's journey and I'm going to explain each of the 12 parts really quickly. And I'm going to lay a movie across this and kind of demonstrate what those 12 parts are. The reason I want to show you these 12 pieces is because as we're talking about this, I would love for you to think about your own life and think about how these 12 pieces or some of these 12 pieces have shown up in your story. Maybe make a mental note. Again, Jason's going to come up and kind of drive it home and guide you through a more concrete process. But I just want you to be thinking, yeah, I, I, I know when that happened in my life. I know when that step happened. And no one really probably 
you may not have all 12 of these, but that's okay. So the hero's journey. And if you don't know, I can tell you some movies that were made using this. It's the most prolifically used template. Uh, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Superman, Iron Man, uh, Lion King, Lord of the Rings, Matrix, Goonies, pretty much every movie you've watched uses this. That's my point, okay? Now, here it is. The first step in the hero's journey is this, the ordinary world. This is where we meet our hero. Now, in ordinary world, we meet our hero, and something is generally missing in their life. Maybe it's something that's been taken from them or some symbolic deficiency that they have or they're, they're... they're, uh, just, they're lost or whatever it is, but we meet them in this non-ideal state, step one. Now, in the Bible, we see this happen all the time. Gideon, we find, do you remember where he is? He's hiding in the threshing room floor because he's afraid of the Midianites. When we first hear about Adam, it says it's not good that he was alone, unideal state. Paul, well, he was killing Christians. So we meet people in this state. I want to lay this movie Rocky across the template just to demonstrate what this, how this looks like for all these 12 pieces. And I say Rocky because you're like, oh, because you're old. Yes, but also they're still making Rocky stuff. Next year, Creed 3 is coming out in 2023, and it's the same movie every time, let's just be honest. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how old you are, you've seen the movie, all right? All right. In the movie Rocky, we, find, we meet Rocky as this two-bit average boxer who's actually collecting money for a bookie and breaking thumbs if they don't pay up. He's got no friends to speak of. He's got no love interest. And the manager at the gym he works out just took his locker away from him, which is a big deal for him. That's step one, the ordinary world. But in the hero's journey, there's a call to adventure. And the call to adventure is pretty significant because This sets the course for our hero. This is the goal of the hero, right? Uh, And you see this too throughout scripture. Um, And we oftentimes, in in movies, this will look like a blunder. Like accidentally, this guy gets this accidental invitation to do something that there's no way he can do, or it could be uh, deliberate. We see Moses, right, is is called to lead the people. Um, David was the anointed king, but the problem is there is already a king, Again, Gideon's got to fight the Midianites. In Rocky, Apollo Creed, the heavyweight champion of the world, decides to make a big fight and make it interesting by allowing some no-name guy a chance at the title because America is the land of opportunity. So he's going to let the Italian stallion, the immigrant, fight him. That's the opportunity. But as soon as Soon as the call to adventure happens, the next step occurs. That's the refusal of the call. Well, that's when our often reluctant hero has to decide, do I want to take this adventure or not? Do I have what it takes? Am I willing to go and do all this stuff? Moses, remember? Moses, lead my people. I can't speak. Uh, Gideon tests God by putting the fleeces out. And, uh, Abraham and, Lara, and, and Abraham and Sarah decide to laugh at God when he tells them you're going to have a baby at 100. Rocky answers the call by saying thanks, but no thanks. He's in terrible shape. Uh, he's got no manager, and he just lost his locker in the gym. So he tells him no. But enter the mentor. And we all know in Rocky, the mentor is, who knows, Come on. Adrian's is love interest. That's later. Mick. Mick. And it's not a glowing relationship from the get-go. They have a few rounds before he becomes the mentor for Rocky. But we see this. You know who the disciples' mentor was, by the way, in Scripture? Yeah, Jesus. That was probably a pretty good one. Um, but this is this meeting the mentor is the mentor is going to come and train you, but you got to do this on your own. I'm not going to do it with you. So they're going to drop off the scene in a little bit. And then the crossing into the threshold. This is where the adventure finally begins. They've made the decision. They're going forward. They receive the training from the person and they step over the threshold. And this is 
uh, often a, a sketchy place to be. They're committed to the task, and they enter this special world where the rules kind of become different. David, you remember, steps forward to face Goliath. <laughs> New world. Gideon gathers his warriors in Rocky. He takes, uh, fully takes on the adventure when he crosses the threshold. And this is what's interesting because we're going to find out Rocky's battle is not what we think it is. His first step in the adventure is when he asks Adrian out on a date. That's his first crossing over into the threshold. The next is we find out our tests, our allies, and our enemies. And this, in this special place, you have to do things differently if you want a different result, right? And so he finds in the, in the test allies and enemies, you find out who's against you, you find out who's on your side, who's going to be with you, and you find out what the new rules are for engagement. Rocky continues to try and win over Adrian, but... She make, he makes good friends with Polly, the brother of Adrian. And what's interesting about Polly, if you can remember this, Polly invites him into his meat locker where he gets to beat up sides of beef. And that becomes a big news article. And then, then the meat place provides his uh, robe for the fight that night. It was one of his allies. Step seven, he approached the innermost cave. And the innermost cave is pretty interesting because it's the deepest, darkest, very dangerous place. And in order for you to be on the hero's journey, you have to enter the dangerous place. Now, for, you see, this is interesting too. You see with, in the Bible, even Jesus has this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? He's about to be crucified. And what does he say? He prays and says, is there any other way? <laughs> but I'll do it. But if there's another way, I want to I wanna ask you to consider that, God. Gideon takes his 300 and surrounds the camp. The stage is set. And here's what's interesting with Rocky. We think that Apollo Creed is, is his enemy. He is not. Rocky's enemy is his mind. He doesn't believe he can be anything. And so he has to fight to be able to believe he belongs in the ring with the heavyweight champion of the world. And he reveals this information in a very hot, lit conversation he has with his trainer, Mickey. And then the ordeal. The ordeal is his biggest test yet. This is where the hero faces a life or death moment. Am I going to go forward? at risk of dying, or am I going to turn back and go, go back to my old world? For Gideon, he breaks the jars, remember, holds the candles up, breaks the jars, and then says, for God and Israel. Bear in mind, he had 300 men facing 135,000 people. Odds weren't great. For Rocky, this starts the training montage, the beginning of Rocky, of Rocky's ordeal, where he pushes through it until he ascends the the stairs, right? Remember him dancing around at the top of the stairs? He realizes in his own mind, I can do this. And then, step nine, reward or seizing the sword. And after surviving, the hero takes possession of whatever it is he set off on his quest on. And that can be a, a physical thing. It can be a love interest. It can be a token. It can be all kinds of stuff. But he finally gets his the quest that he's, he, uh, the reward that he's looking for. The disciples had newfound boldness. For Rocky, his reward is the return of his faith to himself. He finally knows, I can do this. And he has a scene at the end where he's talking to Adrian at night. He'd gone to the, the ring, and he just, like, he comes back and says, Adrian, I can't beat him. And she says, well, why not? And he said, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. I just want to go the distance because no one's gone the distance, and I can do that. So he has this victory in, in his hands. Step 10 is the road back. Now that, he's got the, now that he's got the possession, he's got to head back to the ordinary world. He's not out of danger yet for Moses that's wandering in the wilderness before they hit the promised land for the disciples. They have to go into a hostile world that doesn't really want to hear the good news. But Rocky, 
On New Year's Day, the fight between Rocky and Creed is held, and Rocky realizes in the challenge that they're equally matched, and this is not going to be a fun fight. Number 11 he gets is, is the resurrection, and this is the final test, the rebirth of the hero, and it's the miraculous transformation moment. Rocky's knocked down many times, but every time he gets up, and what's interesting is there's a scene where he gets knocked down, and Paul Creed finally feels like he's beaten him. But Rocky gets up one more time, and Creed like looks down like, ugh. He's experiencing his own defeat. Fight goes 15 rounds. Both of the guys are pushed to the brink of exhaustion. And then the final step is return with the elixir. And this is an interesting step because once you've conquered your hero's journey, you have to take the elixir back to the ordinary world. And the ordinary world should change, right? If you've done this whole quest and you head back and the world doesn't change, then it was just an exercise in stupidity and high risk. And this is where it's really interesting when you think about your own life and your faith walk and sharing your story and how Jesus Christ intersects because if you've received Jesus into your life and you're heading into your world and it's making very little different, much like mine before Chuck, then maybe I don't have the elixir I thought I had or maybe I need to retake the journey. And in our story... If we desire the hero's journey in our lives, we have to identify what's missing in our life. We have to face dangerous things that we're not sure we can do. We're gonna have to uh, find our allies and our mentors, and we're gonna uh, admit our shortcomings. And... But these are the parts of the story for each of us as we're cultivating and crafting the story that we're gonna share about how Jesus changed the way we live that we should consider. So, that's the hero's journey, and maybe you have pieces of that in your life. I want you to think about that, but here's what I want to share with you just in the closing minutes here. I want to talk about being prepared to share your story, and I want to look at 1 Peter 3.15, and it says that, well, let me just tell you the first point is this, that your story is important. I started with this, and it's easy to discredit your story, but I'll tell you this, when I was, it's probably... I don't know, maybe two years after K2 had started, I got invited to go down to Orlando, Florida with a group of like 15 people. I didn't know any of them. And we were just, and, and, the day, and it was a weekend. And what we were gonna do over that weekend, we were gonna sit around and talk. That was the whole thing. <laughs> like, okay, I'll go, because it's Orlando, I guess. But um, So I went, and all these people were in similar roles to what my role was at K2. And the first thing that the person led us through was sharing our story. So a couple of people went and they shared their stories and they were really, really dynamic. <laughs> they, I mean, they had great stories. So he said, Mike, why don't you share your story? And I'm like, well, okay. I don't really have a great story like you guys. I shared my story similar to the one I just shared at the beginning of the message. And someone said, Mike, I want you to hear me say something to you. Don't ever discredit your story again. Your story is the story of Jesus Christ working in your life. And that is as dynamic as any story in the world. And I want to say the same thing to you. You may have a crazy past or you may have a boring past. None of that matters. You sharing your story in honesty is very important. Look what 1 Peter 3.15 tells us. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks to give a reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. That's pretty important. What is the hope that you have? Are you hoping that it doesn't rain? Are you hoping for a raise? Or... Could we be presenting the hope in Jesus Christ, a new way to live? That's what Paul is talking about when he's writing this letter to Peter. Your story is important. Never discredit it. Always be prepared to share it. The second is this, that fear is not an excuse for you to not share. I get this too because you think, oh, I don't know if I share my story. They might check out. They might not like it. They might be offended because they're a different religion or they're this or they're that or whatever. 
I don't think you should think about any of that stuff. If the opportunity for you to share your story comes up, you should share it with boldness. And I want to demonstrate this because I don't know if you know this. If anyone understood the peril of sharing your story at high risk, it's, it's Paul as he's writing to Peter. Now, this book or this letter that Paul wrote to Peter was written directly to Christians that four, four different communities along the southern coast of the Black Sea. Galatia, Bithynia, Pontius, and Cappadocia. Now these, that's, uh, by the way, it's a little teaching moment. If you ever read the Bible and you go, I thought that was in Asia. No, Asia Minor is a Roman province. It's an ancient world. <laughs> these are in, in that world, okay? And he's writing directly to Christians that, that live in that area, okay? And hostility and suspicion were, ri- were on the rise uh, beca- in that empire because the, the people that lived there felt that uh, they, they were getting suspicious of like this new subversive world that they spoke about, like this, uh, this subversive lifestyle, a different way to live. And they're thinking that they're actually creating a new kingdom, So there's a lot of anger towards the Christians at that time, okay? And, uh, well, they had not yet received the official ban. Christianity had not yet received the official ban. This is 64 AD, and remember what happens in 70 AD? Burning of Rome, officially illegal to be a Christian, all this kind of stuff. This is under Nero, who's not a good guy. And uh, it's setting the stage for martyrdom and the abuse of Christians. And then... Just between 70 AD and the writing of this, Peter is, cruci- is crucified upside down, according to tradition, under Nero- Nero's rule. So, when you read this verse, let me just take pause here for a minute. He says, I'm going to look at 13 through 16, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Here's the answer. Pretty much everyone around you. Pretty much everyone, okay? But even if you should suffer for what is right, which is increasingly likely, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. In other words, Christ is your compass. Don't fear them. Fear God. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. He gets it. You sharing your faith may come at a high cost. How many of you feel like you could be killed if you share your faith? Probably none of us. They did. So I want to encourage you Don't let fear of sharing your faith be your guide. And the final thing is this, and we've all experienced this, don't let your story be a weapon. What happens when you're under attack, just like these guys were? What do you want to do? Fight back so you can get aggressive. How many of you had someone like shouting at you what you're supposed to do, and you thought, great suggestion, thanks for the tip, I'm going to do that. No, we react. And he says this, look at, again, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks, or everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Your story is just your story of your interaction of Jesus Christ and how he's changed you and, and the world around you and your everyday decisions. Be prepared at all times to share And story, again, is one of the foundational pillars of communication. It's the fabric of community. There's one last verse, and I'm going to have Jason come on up here. It says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Your story matters to you and it matters to everyone around you. Always be prepared. Jason.
if you don't have one of these forms, grab, raise your hand. Uh, the, the ushers will come down and give you one. Get something to write with this last bit we're going to do. 10 minutes, 15 minutes will be super practical. And we want you to be able to write and uh, fill in uh, some pieces of your story. So keep that hand up. By the way, full disclosure, I like begged Rut and Dave to be able to put on the Rocky sweatsuit, like run up the stairs to the music of Rocky and at the top do some shadow boxing. Done on. And they rejected my proposal. So they're off my Christmas card list. That's it. It's not happening. All right. Like I said, super practical here. What we want to do is just give you some, some pointers, some help, some tips on how to construct your story tonight, okay? And uh, as we get going on that, obviously we want to start with, hey, what's the purpose of doing this? What's the purpose of telling your story? And that's really clear, okay? Our purpose, when we want to share our story, is really to showcase, okay, to spotlight the love and power of God in our lives. Let them know what we've received. Let them know how we've been transformed. We want to offer them a chance to say, hey, this is what's happened to me. This could happen to you and give some inspiration for them to be pursuing that same route. So that's why we're doing it. So just keep that in mind as we go through the whole night tonight. That's, that's really our purpose and why we'd be telling our story. And then I'm going to break. Mike gave us kind of these 12 pieces of the, of the hero's journey. We're going to break these into like three acts. Okay, just visualize this in three pieces tonight. Okay, the, the before, the during, and the after of your journey. Okay. Before, during, and after. Three-part story. And even as we start talking about it, I'm going to give you some questions to be thinking about, okay, what happened to me before, during, and after? Just to ping your thoughts, to, 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 to challenge your mind on what happened to me, and we're going to write that down. And then also, just for reference here, Paul actually gives his testimony in Acts 26. He gives it to King Agrippa, and he does that ex- same thing in just a few short, short verses, his before, during and after. So I'm going to reference Paul here as we do that, just to give you an example to go back to in the Bible. So let's think about this part one of your journey, the before. Here's some questions to get your mind thinking, and you don't have to answer all these, but interact with these and engage with them to see what happened to me, okay? Uh, What was your life like before God stepped in and saved you, before he changed you? Two, what was wrong with your heart? What was going on in there deep down in terms of your the center of your emotions. How did you feel? Were you hopeless, selfish, guilty, angry? And three, what was like the major way your life wasn't working? Okay. What was the problem statement of your life? Uh, Did you have relational challenges? Was there addictions, trauma, pain? What was going on there in terms of how your life wasn't working? And let me just reference Paul here over to Acts, Acts 26. If you look at like some of the descriptors Paul gives in his testimony, it's like, you guys knew how I lived uh, beforehand when I was young. And, uh, and by the way, it wasn't that great how Paul was living, right? He said, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. I put them to death. I cast my vote against them. Um, in fact, it was so bad, he was obsessed with persecuting them. He was even hunting them down. Okay, so that was like Paul's life beforehand. I mean, that's an extreme example of where he was actually going after Christians. But like, for you, back to those questions, think about that. What was going on before you, you, you encountered Christ? Okay, what, what was in your heart? Take a moment, just grab your sheet here. Just write down like your strongest impressions on here. We're going to take a couple minutes here. Just write, what is God speaking to you in terms of like what your life was like before you met Christ? Okay, take about two minutes, write down your strongest thoughts on that. By the way, I guess some of you are on your spiritual journey. You, you may have not reached that point where you've made some decision to, to give Christ your life. But still, what, what's your... How does it feel today for you? What's your problem statement around what's not working in your life? It's still a valid thing to be thinking about wherever you're at on your journey. Yeah. I think this relates to everybody.
of your story, the during part, okay? And again, let's look at a few questions here to just kind of um, ping your thoughts. And uh, so what did God do to step into your world? What did he do to step into your world? How did, this, how did his power enter into your life? How did God transform you? Uh, what was your kind of process? What was your experience to understand and accept the gospel and what God was trying to show you? And finally, like, what did God ask you to do? Uh, and what were some of the steps you took to obey him? All right? What were some of the steps you took to obey him? When we look in on, on Paul's life, and this is at Acts 26, 12 through 18, again, he had a pretty dramatic version of this. Remember the Damascus Road experience, giant light from heaven, he fell to the ground, um, God stepped into his world physically. Okay, I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Um, and he showed him who he was. He said, uh, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. I'm this guy you've been persecuting. Okay, this guy you've been working against and sending my people to prison. And then he gave him a command. Get up, stand on your feet. Uh, I've appeared to you for a mission. I want you to do something to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen. Okay, so God, this is how God stepped into Paul's life. So again, take a look at those three questions on, on part two. How did God step into your world? How did he transform you? What did he ask you to do? Think about those and write down your strongest impressions. What, 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 what are some of your thoughts from your own life, your own story on where God stepped into, into, your, into your world? One more part here to, to take a think about. So part three, we've done the before, and the during, and now the after. So again, let's look at some, some questions. Um, after, what has happened since God showed up? What's different in your life now? Okay, what's changed? Particularly, how has your heart changed? Um, maybe even how has your behavior changed? But overall, how would you summarize just how that, what love, power, and hope that God's given you, what's kind of your, your story, your inspiration, your hope now that you've had this um, interaction with, uh, with Jesus. And for Paul, it, it, was, it was super powerful. Looking over to Acts 26 again, looking at verses 19 through 23, uh, Paul obeyed, and his life was just radically different, okay? He was not disobedient to this vision that came to him from heaven. And instead of persecuting, now he's out, Preaching, again, he was appointed to take this gospel to the Gentile world. I preached that they should repent and turn to God. And indeed, this is why some Jews seized me. He used to be seizing people. Now he's being seized, taking God's message to the people. Um, but God was with him and helped him to this very day. Okay, So that was kind of Paul's story of transformation that, that occurred, really going from one extreme 
to another. So again, let's think about that after story for yourself and write down, again, some of the strongest impressions God's given you. Talk to him if you need help in terms of what Lord did you do for me that's the, that really stands out for you. Well, let's write down. this is what I want to see happen in terms of transformation in my life. Will you help me with that? He's, he's, he's ready and willing to help you in your time of need there. Okay. So let's put these three pieces together. Like what's the take home message of, of what we do with this? Let's show this final slide here on some final thoughts and tips. Okay. And, and hopefully you give me permission here to give you a bit of homework. So if you've never done this before, I'd strongly recommend you take and take these three pieces, your before, during, and after, and try to write out, just maybe for the first time, about a five to 10 minute version of your story, okay? That's a good place to start about the right amount of stuff. You can do longer ones, and, and, and many of us have done that, or even shorter ones, but like five to 10 minutes is a good segment of where you can really communicate something to somebody, and it's a great starting point. So I'd definitely recommend you do that. And that means you won't be able to cover everything of your whole life, and that's fine. I'll pick one major arc. Uh, one, one, one piece of your narrative and focus on that. Um, something that has some punch, though, has some of those elements that Mike talked about in terms of some powerful elements of your story. Keep it short, keep it simple, keep it focused. Uh, you know, when you have that opportunity with somebody, you don't know when you're going to have it again. Make it count by it being focused and really getting to that point of how God's power has really flowed in. And then once you've got it written out, um, Strongly recommend this one. If you've never given that before, the first time you give it, find a safe person, safe place, just practice it. Give it to one person you really trust that it won't be, you know, super skeptical judge and, and will just hear you out, hear your story, uh, let you uh, practice. Uh, we do this in our staff. Our staff gives their stories to each other all the time. Great place to do this is in small groups. If you've never done that, it's a great place to to practice in small groups and just hear each other's stories for the first time in a, in a safe environment. Like, what, what's going on? You get to know people. Uh, take somebody out to dinner. Take a friend out to dinner and, and give your stories. But, you know, this is one of these deals where we're practicing it. will really make it um, come alive for you and make you a lot more comfortable as you do it over time. Okay, and, and, and right back to where we started. Make sure that as you're doing this, again, what's the purpose? It's really to showcase what God's done for us. So make sure that peace and his power, the gospel is really woven through and amongst your story, okay? Make sense? All right. Yeah, well, on the homework, like I said, if you've never done that, I really encourage you to write out your story, practice it with somebody, and then that'll just make you so much more ready to actually to give your story, okay? And I'm just gonna close this night, pray for success in this, pray for... Uh, God, to come alongside us and, and help us. So, so, Lord, I ask for just that. Um, I know this can be an intimidating prospect when you're first learning to share your story, Lord, but I know that, uh, as, as Mike taught us, that uh, we each have a unique story for a reason. It's powerful. And uh, you've given us a story, Lord. And uh, we just pray that we'll be diligent about developing the details of that, Get ready to share, Lord, and uh, that we indeed will be prepared to give people um, just a picture of that hope that's in our heart that you've given us, Lord. And so we just pray for your favor in this exercise, Lord, and, and we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>